Good morning, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute. Thank you for joining another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. And we're very fortunate today to be joined by Illinois State Representative Teresa Ma, who is joining us from her home in Chicago. Uh, Representative Ma has an amazing story. Um, she's a native of San Francisco, went to the University of California, Berkeley. Then she moved to Illinois to study uh, graduate school at the University of Chicago, earned a PhD there, taught at uh, Bowling Green University for a number of years, came back to Chicago and has been very active in politics and community affairs since then. She's the co-chairman of the House uh, Progressive Caucus. And in 2016, she was elected to the Illinois General Assembly, becoming the first Asian American to serve in the Illinois General Assembly. Representative Moss, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, let's, let's talk about a, sort of your story as it began. I know you grew up in San Francisco in the Chinatown section, as I understand it. And as someone who loves Chinatown and just you know visits there whenever I'm in San Francisco, I've always been struck by what kind of a thriving, self-contained community it is. At the same time, you have all tourists like me kind of peering in and looking over. I mean, what, is there a sense of kind of growing up in a fish fishbowl or do you just kind of, kind of tune out us tourists and go about your business? What is it like growing up in Chinatown? Well, actually, I did not grow up in Chinatown. I was born in Chinatown in San Francisco, um, but my parents um, moved to one of the Western uh, neighborhoods in the city uh, very shortly after I was born. Um, but San Francisco is a very small city, and so you know we we spent a lot of time in Chinatown. Um, it's also a very diverse city, and um, you know, I, I got to spend time in a number of different neighborhoods because of businesses that my parents ran. Um, and so I think that in a lot of ways that prepared me for uh, representing the diverse district that I now represent because um, it, it reflects um, my, my growing, growing up years in, in many ways. And you had mentioned your dad owned kind of the corner store, did he not? And, uh, and did you help out working there and such? Oh, yeah, from a very young age. And I think that's a very common experience in immigrant families. You know, they enlist their, uh, their family members and, and kids, um, you know. So I was, I was child labor from, from the start. <laughs> um, but I, I think that that experience also... Um, you know, gave me uh, a sense of, you know, working with different people, you know, meeting all kinds of people and, you know, communicating with them, interacting with them and, um, and, and, you know, really learning, um, you know, firsthand, um, you know, what it takes to, to run a business, to support a family, you know, to, be um, an immigrant, you know, new to this country um, in pursuit of the American dream. You know, that was my parents' experience. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, I, that's something that, that's been, um, you know, internalized in me. You, you had said that you, you're, you're, as you reflect on your, your early years, there was kind of complicated messages coming from your family. On the one hand, you know, to be successful and purposeful and hardworking, um, which is enormously important attributes. I think at one, one point you said there was also maybe a, a kind of a suggestion or at least a, an inclination to be risk averse and not to kind of drift too far out of comfort zones. Talk about those kind of dual pressures, as it were. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so um, it, it was always remarkable to me that, you know, my parents, um, you know, took huge risks, right? They moved halfway around the world in their 20s, um, you know, lived in an entirely different culture. Um, you know, my mom wasn't very proficient in the language and, and um you know, they, so they took a lot of risks to um, secure, you know, success for their family and, and survival for their family. Um, and so I think that their inclination is to, you know, be more conservative at the end of it, you know, to uh, encourage their, their kids to, you know, do what it takes to, um, 
you know, to, to survive in the same way, but not, you know, have to take the risks that they, that they did. And, um, and, you know, I think that's the case with a lot of immigrant families, you know, they, they encourage you to work hard, do well in school, you know, try to pursue a professional career and um, have that stability and security, um, which, you know, you, I guess you can't blame them for, for wanting that, you know, for, for the next generation, right? They, because they came here for a better life. Um, you know, they don't want to take too many risks to blow that in any way. Um, but I think that, you know, American culture um, is one that, um, you know, requires um, some risk taking for, for uh, success and, and uh, you know, the, the, it's a very different vision from um, the sort of uh, conservative inclinations of a lot of immigrant families. Well, in your specific case, I was thinking of your story where you, you initially started out as a pre-med, you know, taking biology, et cetera. And then as you were going through school, I, I guess I, I got the impression that you realized that was not really where your passion was. And so you shifted to an area that was your passion, history, which was wonderfully stimulating, but you know, the job prospects are probably a little, little yeah. dimmer for a PhD in history than they would be a doctor. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was able to kind of, you know, sell my parents on that risk by saying, well, you know, I'm pursuing a different kind of doctorate. <laughs> um, you know, it's not an MD, but I'll be a different kind of doctor. And uh, I, you know, I really didn't have um, a lot of, you know, I didn't really have a sense of, um, you know, how challenging the, the job prospects in that field would be. You know, I didn't have a whole lot of role models to, um, uh, to guide me in that regard. And, you know, it really wasn't until graduate school that you really figure out, boy, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily um, a, an easy career path, right? Um, you know, I, I also moved uh, across the country, you know, to a different part of the country. Um, and, uh, you know, my parents really, you know, they, they, they weren't very, um, they weren't very happy about that. But I had to remind them that, you know, hey, you know, when you were in your 20s, you moved halfway around the world. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not doing anything that different. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, I think that um, it was ultimately it was worth it. I I uh, I think it is important to pursue one's passions and and you know um, you know be happy. You know, do do what makes you happy, and uh, you know, do what what you believe in. Well, tell us a little bit about studying at Cal Berkeley, um, and then you know you you moved as you said suggest to Chicago to uh, study to get a PhD at the University of Chicago. So talk about those two experiences, Cal Berkeley, and and then moving to uh, Chicago to go to U of C. Yeah, well, they couldn't have been more different. Um, you know, when I went to Cal Berkeley, um, you know, I remember being a part of uh, student activism. You know, there were strikes and demonstrations, you know, every other semester, it seemed, um, you know, there's a real sense of, um, you know, a, the legacy of, you know, the student movements in the 60s. And, you know, when I was there in the 80s, uh, you know, you still felt that that legacy. And, um, um, you know, you couldn't, avoid learning about it, right? Or, or getting involved in things that, that were um, happening on campus. And so, you know, it was a real eye-opener and a, a learning experience for me. Um, it uh, gave me a sense of, you know, the importance of, of getting involved in, in um, you know, pursuing, uh, you know, activities that, that you know, collective action that, that could make a difference. And I think that stuck with me. But, um, you know, when I 
arrived at the University of Chicago for graduate school, it was a completely different experience. Um, you know, first of all, it was a PhD program um, and a very competitive, competitive one. So, you know, um, that was in, in a lot of ways, you know, initially an intimidating and, and um, you know, not, um, not a very collaborative experience. You know, there was more competition between, um, between students than, than collaboration. And, um, you know, so that doesn't make for a necessarily uh, pleasant uh, experience. Um, it was also, you know, at the height of the culture wars when I was there and, um, and there's, you know, a bastion of traditionalism and, and conservatism that's, that was very much present at the University of Chicago at the time. So, you know, for, for those who are coming from a different perspective, you know, it can be, you know, not, not exactly welcoming. So, you know, that was, that was a, quite a contrast in experience, um, you know, on top of the culture shock of, you know, moving to the Midwest from California. <laughs> Well, and then you, uh, you, after you finished up at U of C, you went to Bowling Green, which was maybe another kind of movement. Right. What, what, to tell us about just, the, you were there for five or six years, uh, what, you, what were you teaching, and what was your experience of the academic world? Was it, uh, was it all that you hoped for, or was it, uh, was it something that was good for a period of your life, but then uh, it was important to transition to something else? Yeah, so um, I, I taught at Bowling Green for, for six years. I was in the ethnic studies department and, you know, it was unusual for a Midwestern um, university to have um, such a department, but, you know, it was also something that came out of student activism in the 60s and 70s where um, the uh, Latino students at the time, you know, pushed for um, ethnic studies classes and they were eventually able to establish um, a department um, and a cultural diversity requirement at the at the university so that there would be demand for the courses um, and um, I think it was in in some ways it was very rewarding to to be able to teach um, that topic um, you know I, I think it's it's important and, and, you know, necessary at any institution of higher learning. Unfortunately, you know, the opportunities to, to take those courses and, and discuss those topics are few and far between. Um, but it was also, you know, in a lot of ways kind of, um, um, you know, not very appreciated or, or welcomed um, by many of the students because, you know, they resented, you know, having to, to talk about, you know, so-called PC topics and, you know, in, and uh, there was a sense of resentment, you know, for um, being forced to, you know, confront inequality, you know, whether it was discussions of, you know, racial inequality, class inequality, gender, um, or sexuality, you know, those were the topics that, that we talked about in, in our classes that we taught about. And, and um, you know, not everyone was eager to learn those things or even, you know, broach those topics. Um, so, you know, it was, it was challenging. Um, and, you know, on top of that, living in an environment that wasn't as um, diverse or, you know, culturally, um, you know, vibrant and rich as, you know, I was used to, I think that was very challenging for me personally. So, you know, that was one of the reasons I decided to, um, you know, move back to a more urban environment. And then when you moved back to Chicago and you were involved in a group called the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, and then later for another group called Coalition for a Better Chinese American Community. Talk mm -hmm. about those two uh, groups. I mean, this is sort of uh, kind of shifting into a more activist phase of your uh, professional work. 
Yeah, so um, when I came back to Chicago, I was, um, I, I worked for a few years back at the University of Chicago at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. Um, but, you know, after a few years, I did move into um, another direction in my career. And um, I, I worked for the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. And, you know, th they're still around, they're doing great things. Um, you know, it's a really uh, important immigrant rights advocacy organization. They worked on policy and, um, and organizing and they had a grassroots grassroots network of um, organizations all over the state. So, you know, it was really refreshing and um, inspiring to be a part of an organization that was able to move policy and, you know, get things done um, by putting pressure on elected officials. You know, I went down to Springfield for the first time um, back then and, you know, saw them at work, you know, with their busloads of of uh, of community advocates, um, you know, going to to talk to legislators about legislation they were pushing, and um, I saw the power of organizing at work. Right, so you know that was that was really important, and and then um, I went to work for the Coalition for a Better Chinese American Community, um, which was one of their member or organizations. It was embedded in the community based in Chinatown. Um, and, um, you know, it was important work for me to, to get involved with at the time because, um, you know, it was um, a community that, that really, you know, needed more resources and, and um, you know, needed elected officials to really take them seriously, but, you know, it wasn't really happening, um, you know, at, at the rate that, you know, we would have liked to see. And so, you know, there were a number of projects that we worked on, um, you know, while I was a, um, on staff with that organization that, you know, kept pushing at elected officials to, you know, pay attention and to, you know, build a new library, which, which was desperately needed or to, um, you know, save the post office, which was, you know, being threatened with closure and um, to build a park nearby because, you know, the one that had been there had been torn down 60 years ago. And, um, you know, we were eventually able to, get some of those things. And, and we also, you know, won a huge victory uh, in the 2011 redistricting process because the community had been um, divided into several different state rep districts and se state Senate districts um, and, you know, four different city wards or, you know, something ridiculous like that, right? And, um, you know, that was, that was an important um, um, project that that I became involved in because um, you know it led to the drawing of the state district that I now represent um, and um, you know made it possible I think for um, the population to elect the first Asian American to serve in the General Assembly. Well, let's talk about the second district. I mean, it's often described as the most diverse or among the most diverse in, in all of Illinois. Tell us about the second district, what communities it encompasses, what's it like? Yeah, so it's, it's a district I'm really proud to represent. It includes um, amazing neighborhoods like uh, Chinatown, Pilsen, Bridgeport, uh, McKinley Park, uh, Brighton Park, a portion of Back of the Yards. So, you know, it is very diverse, you know, um, an overwhelming uh, proportion of immigrants in our population, but um, about, it's about, 50, you know, a little over 50% Latino and about 25% Asian, 20% uh, white, um, a tiny percentage of African-Americans. 
And, um, you know, it's just been a pleasure to, to be able to, you know, give my constituents a voice in Springfield, you know, and really pay attention to what their needs are and to try to get them addressed. So, you know, in the four years that I've served, I think that, you know, I'm proud to say, um, you know, I've been as um, attentive as possible to, you know, what the community really wants and needs. And, you know, I've been trying to, um, you know, make sure that, that they are, uh, that they're not ignored and that they're uh, listened to. Um, it's also, you know, challenging to, to serve such a diverse population because, um, you know, there are different language needs and, and, um, and, you know, it's a predominantly working class population. Um, you know, I've got lots of folks who, um, you know, have, uh, you know, who need social services and rely on um, state government. And, and so, you know, we have to be available to, to serve them and, and to be able to push out information in multiple languages so that, you know, it gets out there. Um, and, you know, that's been, um, you know, especially relevant during the pandemic because, um, you know, since, since the pandemic started, you know, and the state rolled out, um, you know, various programs and relief um, efforts, you know, to try to, to help people, um, you know, during this time of crisis. Well, you know, those programs don't mean anything if people don't learn about them, right? Or if the information's not in a language that you read and so you don't know, you know, what to do or that, you know, something even exists. So, you know, it's been a responsibility, you know, for myself and my staff to really make sure that we get the information out there, um, you know, in the format that is accessible to um, our constituents and to make sure that, you know, they know we're accessible and, and how to reach us and that we're there to help. Well, I, I was reading about your first campaign in 2016, and, uh, and, it, and there was an article, I think it was in the Sun-Times, in which you were quoted as saying, nobody will listen to us until we get a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. Talk about uh, how hard it was to get a seat at that table. Um, tell us why you ran in 2016, what it was like, what your challenges were, and what was it like to be a kind of a, a trailblazer? Yeah, so yeah, it wasn't easy to get a seat at the table. Um, it took many years of preparation. Um, I think that preparation might have started in 2006 when I moved back to Illinois and um, I started um, volunteering for various campaigns. Um, you know, I I wanted to I wanted to make a difference. There were no Asian Americans really at any level of government, um, except for you know some you know hyper local um, positions like park district board or um, things like that. And so you know I got involved in a number of campaigns, including Tammy Duckworth's first um, congressional campaign. Um, you know so that you know, I could have a role in, in getting somebody a seat at the table. Um, unfortunately, that was a long process. And, uh, um, but eventually, you know, for me, um, I think that, you know, the experience I had with redistricting and working in the community and, and you know, knowing what the needs are, but, you know, having the challenges that, that I experienced myself, you know, getting elected officials to really listen and, and take action, um, you know, that sort of made me feel um, more determined, you know, that, you know, if I wanted to get the job done, I had to do it myself in a sense. And, you know, having volunteered for different campaigns, I sort of got my feet wet in politics and, you know, learned a lot in the process. Um, I, you know, was pretty active on, you know, lots of different 
lots of different campaigns and, and you know, really learned a lot about um, politics. But, you know, there had never been an Asian American um, elected to the General Assembly before. And I think that, you know, there was a lot of skepticism from all corners, even from within my own community. And, um, you know, that was a challenge as well, because, you know, it seemed like I was the only one who, who could see it, you know, that, that it was possible. Um, and, you know, as they say about Chicago politics or Illinois politics, right? You know, um, what is it? Uh, it ain't the, what, what, what's that, uh, that saying? Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's the, um, it's the virus right now. <laughs> I can't, I'm feeling a little fuzzy, but, um, um, and you know what, it just when I, I saw you talking to a group of students and you were saying that, that it was, you know, to have big ideas and an agenda is really important, but that you said, but I got to tell you, particularly as a woman, raising money is hard. Getting a core of volunteers is hard. So you have to have both ideas and agenda, but just sort of the, the logistics and muscle that would allow you. And I know you had your first primary was very closely contested and I think one of your important meetings with Congressman Gutierrez, the, your opponent, had some people come in and kind of disrupt the meeting. So it was sort of hardball politics on some level. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it was it was hardball for sure. Um, but, you know, another motivation for me was, you know, since I had done a lot of the the work, you know, trying to advocate for the community. Um, you know, I really felt that I was up for the task and, and that I had the insight and the experience and the, um, the sympathy or really the empathy for, you know, the constituents to really push their agenda. And, you know, at the time, um, you know, what I was facing was the potential, you know, installation of a, another generation of, you know, my predecessor. Um, you know, he wanted to put, it, install his son in, in, in that seat, you know, and, um, and I personally, you know, didn't want that person, you know, nice as he was, you know, whatever. Um, I, I didn't want him as my representative. And, and so, you know, it was just an instance of like, you know, if you want the job done, you got to do it yourself. So that's how I decided, you know, I put my hat in the ring because, um, sorry, my, um, um, my, um, yeah, my, my instinct was, it, you know, it, it was more responsibility. I had to, I had to step up. Um, but at the same time, you know, it was on the heels of two um, campaigns that, that I was deeply invested in and deeply involved in that didn't make it. And so, you know, there was a moment when I felt like, okay, well, do I want to go through this again? Right. Because, um, in 2014, I was, um, you know, I had been working for Governor Quinn and, um, you know, really wanted to continue um, as on staff as, um, you know, in his administration, but unfortunately he didn't win re-election. And, you know, so that was a devastating loss for me. Um, you know, that was a campaign that I put a lot into um, and then the following spring, I was involved in um, Chewy Garcia's campaign when he ran for mayor. Um, and, you know, that didn't make it either. And so, you know, I was pretty de dejected in April that year. And, um, you know, I, I really questioned whether I wanted to go through another potential, you know, um, you know, devastation again, if, if I put my hat in the ring and I didn't win. So, um, so I, I, I went through a lot. I, I 
um, thought about it quite a bit. Um, but, um, you know, I, I talked it over with my family. You know, my, my dad in San Francisco um, really helped me decide, you know, because I think he was one of my first examples of, you know, somebody who's really involved in the community and, and cares a lot and is really active. And, um, you know, but as an immigrant in this country, you know, he really didn't have the, um, the language skills or, or the level of education needed to, to really, you know, get involved in politics, but he was always really interested and um, involved. And, you know, when I was young, I remember, um, you know, that, you know, he got, he got mail from, from candidates because he had made donations and, you know, that really made an impression on me because, you know, it's not something you see every day. And, um, um, you know, he, he said to me when we had this discussion that summer, um, you know, I, I, I told him that I'd been thinking about it and, you know, I hadn't fully decided. And he said, well, you know, we don't come from money, but, um, you know, I, I know a lot of people who would be supportive. And if you decided to do it, you know, uh, I'll do my best to, you know, reach out to all those people and, 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 you know, help you build a network of supporters. And, you know, this is out in California, right? Um, you know, so it meant a lot to me to, to have that enthusiasm and support and, um, and, you know, I decided to go for it. We had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with Sherrod Brown from Ohio. And he said at one point, he said, being a progressive means you lose a lot of races, but when you win, it's consequential. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's play off that because I know you're the co-chair of the Progressive Caucus. What does it mean to be a progressive um, in Illinois in 20, almost 21? And how is that progressive agenda? How would you like it advanced next year in Springfield? Well, so to me, being a progressive just means that, you know, you believe in fairness and opportunity. Um, and, you know, you, um, you know, think that, that, um, you know, government can be um, a force for good in people's lives, right? To, to you know, increase equity and, and, and opportunity and, and to help people, you know, live their, their best lives. Um, and for me, it's, it's really important because of the people I represent. So, you know, as I mentioned before, um, you know, I represent a district made up predominantly of immigrants, you know, working families, um, you know, folks who um, sometimes need a little help. And, and um, you know, I also represent a large proportion of senior citizens. Um, so, you know, the kind of policies that, that I support you know, are really for the good of, of my constituents and others like them all around the state. Um, you know, especially, you know, now during this pandemic, we're seeing um, the role that, that government can play and needs to play in, you know, making sure that there's, there's not an inordinate amount of suffering. Um, you know, I think it makes a huge difference, you know, who you have in leadership and the policies that, that are supported. And so, um, you know, I'm proud to be a progressive and I hope that, you know, we're able to, you know, make a difference in, in people's lives. Um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen next session, um, but, you know, we're, we're talking about, you um, um, policies that, um, you know, the Black Caucus is pushing now. Um, and, you know, those are, I think that, you know, any um, policy that has to do with promoting um, equity and, and fairness and, you know, um, correcting some of the wrongs that, um, 
you know, have been in place um, in the past. I think that those are important ag agenda items that, um, that you know, we, we need to champion. And I know that had been the intended focus of the veto session, which of course was canceled recently because of COVID. And it's, uh, I know it's, it's affected you personally. It's sweeping through Illinois and the country and all. So is it your sense that, that those issues will be deferred to early in the new year? Or is that going to be sort of the first issue out of the blocks when, when you return in January, if conditions allow? Mm -hmm. I think so. I think it's important to a lot of people um, and, you know, we've been he uh, having hearings to learn more about um, the, the issues that are at stake. And so, you know, I'm, I'm sure one way or another we'll be um, addressing those, those issues early next year. Let's talk a little bit about the, the, the state budget. Um, the fair tax amendment was defeated. Um, the governor is obviously trying to come up with an alternative approach to shore up the state's finances. Where do you see that going? I mean, do you think there's a chance for a bipartisan coalition on this? Or do you think the Republicans have largely decided that, you know, Democrats can control the executive branch and the General Assembly, so to just step back and sort of let you guys figure out what needs to be done? How do you think that's going to shape up in the, in the next year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm really disappointed that the fair tax failed and, um, you know, it's going to make our jobs a lot harder in the legislature, um, you know, because none of us wants to raise taxes for the average um, taxpayer. Um, and in putting the fair tax amendment on the ballot, that was our intention, you know, to you know, make sure that the vast majority of, of Illinois residents wouldn't have to pay more ta taxes and that the burden should, you know, more fairly fall on um, those who make a lot more money, right, who can afford it. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I think that there was a lot of misinformation out there and, and the the voters were confused and, and you know, maybe um, somehow convinced that, that, you know, this is going to be um, a tax increase in the future, which, you know, I, I kept trying to tell people it's, it's not because, you know, we just, um, there's no appetite for tax increases. You know, we already have the ability to to raise the flat tax, but you know we haven't wanted to do it, you know, unless we desperately had to. Um, and um, it's it's just going to make things a lot harder. Um, you know, there there might be um, you know a way to do it where um, you know we somehow you know, get agreement from our colleagues to, you know, raise the, the tax rate, but, you know, provide enough, um, you know, credits and, and um, incentives for, you know, those, you know, um, at the lower um, uh, income levels to be able to avoid, you know, some of the increases. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, I, I sincerely doubt the Republicans are going to uh, go for any of that. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily see the, the issue of um, taxes to be um, a bipartisan um, issue of agreement. <laughs> Well, let's, let's kind of play off this because behind the scenes in Springfield, is there, um, you know, maybe in some of your committee work, is there more bipartisanship that's, that's in evidence than we see in the headlines? I'm thinking of just your committees. I know you're in a, an appropriations committee, K through 12. You're in environmental justice committee, healthcare licenses. Certainly that can't be a partisan issue. Are there just a, a kind of a whole sort of set of issues that really are perhaps even more regionally divisive than they are um, partisan? Well, 
I will say that it, um, I think the general public's um, idea of Springfield is, um, you know, that it's much more partisan than it actually is in real life. I mean, you know, we, we you know, act in a bipartisan manner all the time. Like you said, in the committees, you know, the, the vast majority of bills that, that we do pass and, you know, most of them um, are, you know, not controversial, you know, routine legislation that, that does get bipartisan support. And, you know, that's almost everything, right? In order for a bill to get through, you know, even if it does get, um, um, you know, if, if it gets uh, passed, then, you know, it had to have some bipartisan support. Um, and, and most of it, most of it does get passed that way. Um, it, I think it's just a very small percentage of bills that's, that's hyper partisan, but those are the ones that get the most media attention and um, you know and the media likes to emphasize the the partisan rancor I guess you know it gets more headlines and is more dramatic but you know we work pretty well together with our colleagues for the most part and you know we have to agree um, to move anything forward so you know you're 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 absolutely right about that there's a lot more bipartisanship in Springfield than um, we're given credit for. Well, one of your committees that, that was interesting to me, it's called Museums, uh, Museum Arts and Cultural Enhancements. How does that work? Tell us what you, you work on. It seems like a very interesting committee to be on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, it's mostly the, the funding that, um, that um, goes out to museums and, and you know, cultural organizations. Um, um, you know, we don't have very many meetings, but, um, you know, I, I'm a big supporter of the arts and so I enjoy being on that committee and, um, you know, at the end of the, um, the end of the session, you know, when the grants, um, go through, it's, it's fun to get letters from all the arts organization <laughs> thanking us for, uh, for our support, so. <laughs> well, one bill that I've seen, I know that you've worked on a lot, is called the Immigrants Protection Act, and it pertains to, I think, housing issues. Tell us a little bit about that. What, what problem you're trying to solve and how, 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 you are, how you are solving it. Sure, that's the uh, Immigrant Tenants Protection Act, um, which, um, I got the idea for that from um, a friend of mine who's in the legislature in California and he passed a similar bill um, and I, I noticed it, you know, it, I think, you know, it was in his newsletter or was on the news somewhere. Um, I read about it and realized that, you know, we really needed something like that here in Illinois. And so, you know, I, I started to work on that. Um, Essentially, why it's needed is that um, a lot of undocumented immigrants or, or, you know, even immigrants who are perceived to be undocumented, um, you know, they're in a vulnerable position with landlords who, you know, may use their status against them. So, you know, we've had, um, you know, instances in which a landlord will, you know, um, threaten a tenant that, you know, they believe is undocumented, um, you know, where they would threaten to call ICE or, um, um, or, you know, evict them because of their uh, status. And they're in a ve very vulnerable position because of that. And um, it, you know, felt really, um, you know, it, it made a lot of sense that, you know, we needed legislation in order to protect uh, folks, you know, who would be in that position. So it, it was something that I was proud to work on. Um, you know, there were 
examples, you know, once I started working on that legislation, I, you know, heard more stories um, about, you know, real instances in which, um, you know, those threat, threat, those kinds of threats were made. And, um, you know, they were in my district and, and, you know, other immigrant communities. So, yeah, it was something I was proud to work on. And, um, you know, given the makeup of my district, I, I think that, you know, it's exactly the type of thing that, um, you know, that I believe in, in being a part of because, you know, it's, you make a difference, right? Um, working on things that are meaningful to your constituents. Right. Representative, we have about two questions. Uh, one is from um, Michael in Carbondale asking about the rural urban divide in Illinois and just how that manifests itself in Springfield and in your sort of day-to-day -day work there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, my, you know, I have, um, personal experience with that in, in some ways because, you know, the, the uh, Farm Bureau um, has a program where they pair um, urban legislators with uh, rural counties and invite us to visit and, you know, and then we also host um, our counterparts from the rural uh, counties to uh, visit our areas and, you know, that's something that has done a lot to foster um, understanding and to break down that rural urban divide. Um, I think that, you know, programs like that are really important and, you know, we, we need to do everything we can because we have more in common than, you know, there are differences. So um, I, I think that, uh, you know, more of my colleagues uh, should take advantage of um, that program that the Farm, Farm Bureau sponsors. And it, um, you know, it's been, it's been a real pleasure to uh, visit, um, you know, my, my um, adopted rural county is McDonough County in Western Illinois. And uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to, you know, to visit and get, get to know more people and, and to be, um, you know, in that environment to, understand, you know, what people all over the state are, are um, going through. That sounds like a great program. We're going to have to learn more about it here. Bill from Evanston wants to know, is what, what could he read to better understand the Chinese American community's experience in the United States? Are there any books or plays or films that might help uh, someone better understand just the struggles of, of and, and accomplishments of your community? Yeah. So um, last year, PBS ran a really great um, series called, um, um, I think it was Asian Americans. Um, you know, I think that's a great starting point um, and it's really accessible uh, in terms of books. I mean, there are just so many <laughs> that it's hard to even... Um, it's it's hard to you know figure out what to, what to list first, but um, yeah, I mean you know when when I was teaching Asian American studies um, back in the day, <laughs> um, you know some of the um, some of the uh, sort of you know, overview histories of, of Asian American studies that, that, you know, I would teach at the time. And this is many years ago, so I think there are more, a lot more updated versions, but, um, you know, Ron, T Ron Takaki and, you know, other folks, they have, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, anything is better than nothing, right? <laughs> that uh, there's a huge rich history to learn about Asian Americans and, um, you know, I think that um, more people should have the opportunity to, to learn um, that history and, you know, I really appreciate the question and, and um, I feel like I should, um, you know, send out a syllabus. <laughs> okay, well, 
we're in contact, so you can send me a syllabus and I will pass that on if you so choose. Well, let me ask you just finally, uh, you know, when you're feeling better, and th first of all, thank you for, for muscling through this. I know you haven't felt well and we're just enormously gracious of you to, to be here to, to power through this illness. So thank you so much. But when you feel great and life is good, how do you like to relax to, uh, to enjoy uh, some time when you're not working hard on the political aspect of things? Yeah. Yeah, it's very important to have that balance, I think. Um, I like to cook and eat and, um, and uh, you know, be out in nature, hiking. Um, yeah, those kinds of things. Well, that's great. Well, when you feel better, we'd love to get you down to Southern Illinois. We'll show you a little bit of the Shawnee National Forest. Oh, yeah. I love, and we'll I love find, Southern. And I've we really- times. We, yeah, we'd love to have you come to campus and meet with students and be out and about in the community. So thank you so much for being with us. You're very generous with your time. And again, we wish you a speedy recovery. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Great. Thank you. All right. And thanks to all of you for joining another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. Uh, thank you for supporting the Institute. And your support allows the legacy of Paul Simon to flourish. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.